Hi, everyone. Today on the podcast, we are very excited to welcome Robert Schramm, um, who is a behavior analyst and also an education and parenting specialist who really is doing some amazing and valuable things for the field and very necessary things for the field. So we're very excited to speak with you. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate being here. Um, we'd love if you can start by just introducing yourself to our audience. Tell us a little bit about you, maybe how you got into the field. Sure. Sure. Um, well, like you said, my name is Robert. Um, I was uh, an educator at first. I started out in uh, physical education originally and then got into special education. And I was working in the school districts in California. And I had an opportunity to work as an inclusion specialist, uh, one of the first inclusion specialists in, in the States, actually. Uh, this was back in the late 90s. Don't tell anyone it was that long ago. Um, and so I was uh, tasked with helping children with um, sometimes even more uh, severe disabilities to be uh, fully educated within a regular education classroom with supports. Um, and through that opportunity, I started working with a lot of kids that were diagnosed with um, ASD. Um, and so uh, I started trying to figure out what I could to, to learn how to really work with them because the master's degree in special education really didn't give me much in the way of uh, uh, practical advice about how to develop real instructional motivation, you know, the desire for kids to want to work with me. Uh, and so that was something that I had to start to figure out on my own. And I eventually found my way to the behavior analysis world, um, learned about uh, the verbal behavior approach to behavior analysis through um, professionals like uh, Jim Partington and Mark Sundberg. Uh, and Vince Carbone was a, was a big influence early on. Um, and then my wife and I moved out to Germany in 2003. And so in 2004, we, we opened up our, our, our service uh, supporting families in Germany, in and around Germany, uh, for children mostly diagnosed with ASD. But um, you know, we would take on any child that that was struggling, um, and we were we would help train parents in behavior analysis approaches to help within their own homes. Um, there was no infrastructure there, so there was no RBTs. There were no therapists to work with. It was just my wife and I and these parents. And so uh, throughout that process over the first few years, I really uh, found that what I was creating was a way to take uh, applied behavior analysis, the, the technical science, and translate it for parents and for people who just have no education in behavior analysis. And ultimately, that led me to writing my first book, um, Motivation and Reinforcement, uh, which, you know, is kind of like the that translation guide. How do I take um, years of behavioral education and break it down into a way that a mom and dad might understand it and be able to use it? Um, and within that book, I created something called the seven steps to instructional control at the time. We call it instructional motivation now, uh, which is figuring out like the seven basic principles that everyone needs to have that you have to have in place to be able to use the environment as a support in developing instructional uh, desires, uh, cooperation, and uh, ended up writing a second book with uh, Dr. Megan Miller. Uh, supporting me on that. Uh, we wrote The Seven Steps to Instructional Control, uh, which is the second book that's up there. Um, after those were done, I started kind of presenting around the world about it. This was back in, I think the second book came out in 2014. Uh, I've been all over the world, been able to present on, on these topics. Uh, I think we've sold over 20,000 books worldwide in like six or seven languages. Um, recently moved back to the U.S., and so now I'm here with uh, my family in Arizona, and I've been working on teaching uh, behavior analysts, therapists, OTs, SLPs, and parents um, how to run ABA programs for themselves and, and uh, using the seven steps approach uh, to uh, kind of guide their ABA. You've said so much information there, and I have picked up on so much of it that I don't even know where to start. Um, I think my first, 
my first comment is, wow, you've done a lot. And I, I'm so happy to be talking to you right now. Um, but when you said that you moved to Germany and, you know, there's so many parents out there and only you and your wife um, to be able to coach these parents through, what a great way to do that. You know, some people will go to places, you know, myself included, and my experience is working with directly with children, right? So, you know, of course, okay, I'll take on this child, take on this child, I'll take on this child. And oftentimes then your caseload becomes so full because you're working directly with a child. Um, but not only that, it's not as effective. You know, if you can train the trainer, if you can train the caregiver to be able to implement things themselves, that it must have been so rewarding for you and probably so much more effective in the long run than just training, you know, even other staff members to come into the house and work with the child. You know, that's exactly what I learned. And, you know, I had come at when we moved out to Germany, my wife is German. So that's why we first moved out there. And we were just going to spend a year or two kind of exploring living in Germany. And um, within a year, we had like 35 families that wanted supports. And, and we were like, there's no way we can travel this entire country uh, and work with these kids. And so we had no choice but to uh, take on the parent training model. Um, but it, it didn't take me long maybe within six months to realize that these families that we were working with, these parents were now as good or better than most of the, the therapists, co-therapists that I'd ever seen working for the, you know, the Lovas in-home programs in California. Um, and because we were using a, a, a family friendly verbal behavior approach, it was, um, you know, these kids were having much more fun and, and it was just a, a much better all around situation. But what I realized is that these, these parents, once they were trained up and knew what to do, they were able to use good behavioral choice, decision-making throughout their entire day. And these kids weren't getting 25 to 40 hours a week. They were getting inundated with every single day, the person who's across from them is knowing what to motivate, what to reinforce, what to avoid, how to prompt, um, you know, how to shape up behavior. And it just, it just ended up being even better for those kids than, you know, bringing in someone to fish for them, you know, teaching those families how to fish was, it just ended up being better all around. And I think that the, the work that we did there really shows that parent training models, um, not only work, but are something you should strive for. For sure. The longer I'm in the field, I think the more I'm seeing the importance of having it be, like you said, an all-inclusive, comprehensive approach, as opposed to I drop my child off, get four to five hours of therapy and whatever happens outside of the therapy session, you know, is separate. Uh, it just doesn't work. And I love that our field can move towards doing more of the caregiver mediated intervention or parent coaching or parent training, because it's so integral to the success of our clients and our programs. To be fair, it works in that um, the kids make progress with an individual or in, a, in an individual setting but it doesn't work in really changing that child's life and the way that they interact with their parents, the way they interact with their school teachers, uh, the way that they understand the world around them outside of your teaching setting. Yeah. It only gets so, them so far. Yeah. You can make progress the other way. You can make progress doing one-to-one -one therapy, but um, the really life-changing stuff comes when everyone in that child's environment understands how to work with them and how to engage them um, and how to keep them interested and motivated and use that motivation to help them try new things and learn new things. So, yeah. And I mean, I had a similar experience. I also came into the field through education. I was a teacher um, and I felt like I just didn't have the tools um, to work with some of the students that I was given. And I was looking for that solution. Um, I also came into ABA after I had my, my kids. So I already had three mm -hmm. kids and I was also looking for that solution as a parent. And I didn't know what I was doing. Parenting doesn't come with a handbook either. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I love about, you know, your seven steps is that it's parent friendly. It's not not just for parents of children with autism. It's not just for practitioners of people with autism. It's it's just good information for anybody who's working with kids and needing to develop that relationship. It's truly the stuff that I wish I knew before I had my kids. I mean, you know, hindsight's 2020. Um, but can you tell us more about like why you developed that and really your intention with, with these seven steps? Yeah, um, sure. I, I appreciate you saying that because that's one of the things that I kept finding as I was working with families who had 
children. See, most of the kids who would come to us were kids who had failed everywhere else. Um, not the kids had failed, but the system had failed them. Um, they, you know, the school systems didn't know how to work with them. The parents didn't know what to do with them. And these kids were finding themselves in dire straits. They were, you know, potentially losing their home placements, potentially getting kicked out of school. And so when we would come in and use these, these basic principles and develop a system in which we could start to get some engagement and get these children to start being excited about working with us and wanting to engage and wanting to learn, um, it was, and the fact that we were teaching it to parents, the one thing that I kept hearing from parents were, well, this is all great. I could use this with my other kids. Like, I, I wish, you know, I, I'm going to use this with my older son who's giving me a hard time about, you know, not bringing the car back on time or my my younger kids who are tantruming in the grocery store. Um, and absolutely, it was 100 percent true. And I was like, yeah, you can use this with anyone. There's nothing about the principles of behavior that has anything to do with any diagnosis. Mm -hmm. It's just about how human beings interact and communicate and social relationships develop. And uh, so I've always considered the seven steps to be a, a social, um, it's kind of like a social relationship development tool. It's something I use uh, with my own kids. I use with my wife, my wife uses with me. I use with my employees. I use with people that I meet on the street because I just know that if I want to have good relationships, there's certain things that I'm responsible for in maintaining those relationships and developing those relationships. Um, and that if I'm able to meet these seven steps principles on a regular basis with the people in my life, um, not only will I be able to get more out of that relationship, but I'm going to make sure that I'm giving what I need to with that relationship to make sure that it works. Um, so with a lot of this, especially when I moved to Canada about three years ago, I moved to British Columbia, Canada, um, and took a job in, in BC, uh, in Penticton, BC. And uh, there is where I first started getting a lot of kids who their diagnosis of autism was based solely on, I would argue, solely on a lack of instructional control, lack of instructional motivation. And with these kids, by just teaching the parents the seven steps, I was able to go in, teach the family the seven steps. We would develop a plan around the house so they would know how to interact and what to do and, and what to focus on. And these kids were making like miraculous uh, recoveries in, in really short periods of time because suddenly they were engaged, they were cooperating, they were making good choices because it was in their best interest to do so. And, you know, I was working with these families for, you know, maybe six months and then they didn't need me anymore. You know, the kids said they weren't, they didn't need everyday teaching. They didn't need to be, you know, taught how to teach tacting and manding and, 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 you know, basically they just needed to learn how to gain instructional control. And so I started working with these families and started realizing that there was a lot that I could do for families out there um, who were struggling just with behavior, but not necessarily teaching right? Not learning how to teach their kids, uh, but just everyday behavior stuff. And so uh, I've gotten together with a, with a uh, partner, um, Kara, who I uh, um, find to be extremely um, helpful and intelligent. I, I, how do you say her last name? Remington? Runnington? Um, and, and she's been working with me and we've been developing a new uh, program called Just Seven Steps. And the idea is to make uh, the seven steps approach available uh, in a wider array to families through online courses and, and teaching. And so that's kind of where my focus has gone recently. So I am familiar with your seven steps. And what I love about it is the plain and simple language that you put it into. You know, as I'm reading through your seven steps, you know, I think, well, that's behavioral analysis. That's behavioral analysis. So is that. Well, of course it is. You're a BCBA. Of course it is. Um, but you simplify it so much that it's just in such parent friendly language that it really, you know, gives you kind of like a warm and fuzzy when you read through it. And you're like, oh, this is really wonderful. You know, as a parent, this is this is great. It's doable. I like the way you've broken that down. Uh, I appreciate you saying that because that really was one of my goals early on. Um, you know, I, I like you, uh, I think it, I can't remember which one of you said it, but I, I you know, I came in as a teacher um, and learned behavior analysis as a way to be a better teacher. I didn't go into science and behavior analysis and then try to apply that to teaching. So my goals were always in uh, being an educator first. And so by taking the principles of behavior 
and working with um, aides and parents, it only made sense that I had to somehow translate this language. And the more that I did it, the more I realized that um, the language was actually becoming a barrier for a lot of people. It was getting in their way. And that's that's what I think the value of my first book was, is that it really did kind of lay it out in, uh, in a simple and easy way to understand. Now, I will tell you guys that I'm in the process of updating um, this book, the, the Seven Steps book. Uh, and then eventually I'll probably be updating this one again to a third edition uh, because I have been updating the steps themselves for the first time in a number of years. Uh, I'm trying to make sure that we stay in the forefront and that we keep up with the way uh, the times have been changing and the way things have been going in society in general and in behavior analysis in general. When I first created the seven steps, they really were an answer to an overuse of escape extinction in our field. Um, when I first came up in the late 90s, early 2000s, escape extinction was, you know, it was part of every program. It's like you, you try to, you try to make what you're doing fun, but as soon as they pull away, or as soon as they withdraw their ascent, you stop them, you block them, you don't let them leave and you, you, you keep them in. And, uh, I found that that just didn't work for me. It didn't work for my parents. Um, as soon as I started to turn my teaching setting into, uh, something that was uh, captive learning, uh, then all of a sudden we lost the trust. We lost the trust of the child and creating uh, an environment that was conducive to long-term teaching was just really, really hard. And so I wanted to get away from escape extinction in my, in my education program. And that's why the seven steps developed. But now here we are 10, 12, 15 years later, and the fields moved into that direction of avoiding escape extinction, but we're even moving beyond that now. So some of the stuff that I recommend in the book with, with full extinction programs that are not escape extinction, but still full extinction may not be as necessary as I thought that they were. So uh, we're gonna be doing some updates uh, real quick. In fact, we're working on it this summer and I'm hoping to have uh, a new version of the book out soon with uh, some changes to the language in the seven steps and everything. So we want to make sure that, that the seven steps stays something people can proudly be using for years to come. Excellent. And I, I love that, um, you know, I think we had a similar experience, you know, Shane and myself, where the field has changed so much and the things that we used to do in practice 10, 15 years ago are definitely not the things that we're doing today. And I think that the way the field is moving towards more relationship building um, and more consent, I think it's super important. And I think that, you know, it's something that we try to emphasize to to all of our staff. And, and it's still it's still a challenge because we get called in and they say, you know, solve this problem or deal with this child. And and my answer is I, can't, I don't have a relationship with him or, you know, you need to build up a relationship or and that's not always the answer that people want to hear. You know, no, like they want a not. quick fix. Um, and so we're often in that position position where we can't give you the quick fix. Um, so, so it's definitely challenging, but I, I, I think it's important for the field to move in that direction because the relationship is so important and it's not behavioral. You know, how do you define a relationship or how do you define, you know, that a child is content and happy? Um, but yeah, I think it's an important thing for us to consider. Yeah. And um, if you're, if you're a professional out there and you're in behavior analysis and you're hanging on to the old guard and you're worried that, any of these new discussions about, uh, you know, that are coming from the the um, uh, the neurodiverse world and progressive behavior analysts who are talking about uh, avoiding extinction and that sort of thing, um, you're probably on the wrong side of things here, and you need to you need to start figuring out how to get onto the right side because the field is moving forward, and we are becoming better at what we do by being more uh, attentive to a child's ability to assent to the programming uh, and to offer their, show us their desire to be a part of things. If your goal is long-term work, you don't want to um, put someone in a prison for five, 10 years to, in the hopes that when they come out, they'll be rehabilitated. You know, you want to be able to to take their hand and skip along the path, teaching them along the way. And that's hard to do when you're using escape extinction. It's hard to do when you're using a lot of extinction of any form. So, um, yeah, I definitely recommend that anyone who's watching this, if you've been in the field for a long period of time and you hear about all these things and Dr. Greg Hanley and some of the work that he's been doing, um, uh, you know, with the My Way program. And uh, I, I just think that you really need to 
to spend some time, look into it and figure out where things are going. Cause I think you're going to be left behind if you don't. Yeah. I mean, we've started using, um, you know, the my way program and one of the, I was observing one of our staff doing it. And this was a child who nobody could work with. Like he was just so challenging and he had, you know, constant escape related behavior and aggression and all that. And, and this other staff started working with him over months and months and months working on the my way program. And I would observed one of their sessions and yeah, everything looked technically good. And, you know, he was doing everything he needed to do, but the thing that stood out for me was the feeling of trust. I was like, these programs are now building a relationship where our clients can trust us. And it's that feeling of they feel safe and they feel like they can trust us where we can actually make progress and make real progress. Um, and even if it means, like you said, a relationship goes both ways. So we may have to compromise some of our goals and we may have to make some changes um, because they may not be able to move as quickly as we want them to go because we're you know, letting them make the choice. Um, but that's all you know, part of what I think we need to move towards as a field. Yeah, I always said um, early on in my development of the seven steps was um, even though you're going to be doing some waiting out of behavior, you're going to be in a situation where you're not able to teach, the child's still learning something. They're learning what what gets them better things, but they're also learning what behaviors they can choose and use that may not be supportive to their own goals. And even though they may not be working on a specific task in the moment, they're still learning something. Yeah. And the question is, in addition to whatever they're learning in that moment, are they learning that you're uh, a positive influence in their life, someone they want to be around and someone they want to learn from, or are they learning that you're someone that they have to deal with, someone they have to overcome and try to avoid or escape? And so whatever we do, we want to make sure that um, we're not damaging our long-term relationship in an attempt to get uh, progress on an individual goal in the moment, because it's that long-term relationship that's going to change that child's life. It's not the um, ability to touch his nose when you say, do this. That's not gonna change his life, but what's gonna change his life is his ability to see his teachers and other adults and other human beings as positive sources of, of, of goodwill and good, good fun and reinforcement throughout the rest of their life, right? And in your seven steps, you talk about follow through and always follow through. And, you know, as a behavior analyst early on, we've always thought, oh, follow through. So that means if I say a demand, I have to follow through with that demand. And no, that's not what it means at all. Follow through means if you say that you're going to get something positive, you're going to get it. So if I tell you that, you know, regardless of your behavior, we're going out for ice cream tonight, we're going out for ice cream tonight. You know, if it's pouring rain, we're still going out for ice cream. Um, and I really like that because that's all part of the relationship developing as well is making sure that you establish that trust by, you know, that follow through when I'm saying things that I'm saying, you know, positive things that you're going to be doing this, or we're going to be doing that, or we're going to be having this, making sure that you can follow through with that. And that was a huge thing as well that, uh, you know, I've always preached in ABA and I love the fact that now it's on the forefront, that it's not just follow through with demand and make sure that, you know, you do this, but it's no, like, be the giver of good things, have them trust what you say. Yeah. So that's one of the things like step number three to instructional control talks about how to give instructions, how to, um, how to uh, go from the fun play into some type of an expectation. And it used to just say, you know, say what you mean and mean what you say, follow through, use the kind of language that you really mean. If you give an expectation, follow through either with positive consequences or negative if you need to. Um, well, what I really am getting more towards now and the way that it's worded is, you know, you want to be giving instructions that make sense. You want to be giving instructions that um, your child's prepared for and is able to handle. And if you're not sure that you're giving an instruction that your child is ready for or would be able to respond to appropriately, don't give it as an instruction, give it as an option, give it as an opportunity. And then because you've given it as an opportunity, you have more leeway in how you react to their reaction. Um, I'm One of the things that I've been getting into more recently is trying to teach behavior analysts that you don't have to talk in SDs all day. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Your job isn't to just down. talk Good from job. SD to SD to SD. It's to have a communication, to have an interaction. And sometimes you're telling the child what needs to be done. And sometimes the child's telling you what they want to do. And sometimes you're saying what you would like to do. And sometimes they're saying and agreeing or disagreeing, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And when you do throw out an SD and you do put it out there as an expectation, you should have the, the follow, you should be planning to follow through. But that means follow through in both directions. It means make sure that when you say something, you're going to do it um, when you ask for something. And if you don't get it, that you're going to follow through. But how you follow through 
is uh, covered in one of the later steps. And step seven is that step that I normally would talk about for what to do when a child does not respond well or does not engage the way that you're hoping. And step seven is now turning into a troubleshooting step. It's instead of being, this is what you do every time a child doesn't respond. Um, I think that that's, we've moved beyond that in our field. And now no, step seven is going to be about troubleshooting and figuring out what did we do wrong in the first six steps? What did we do wrong as we were developing our environment that put us in a position where this child isn't wanting to cooperate the way we thought they would? So I think let's go back. What you're saying is so important because people don't even realize that they're giving all these demands and people who mean so well, like, you know, a lot of the staff I work with, they, they want to engage with the child. So what do they do? what's your name? How old are you? What is this? What are you doing? And they don't realize that all of those are demands, you know, especially when they're questions the child doesn't even know the answer to. Um, And that, and, and so I think starting from a point where just helping them understand that these are demands, we don't have to go through a day drilling kids with questions, um, how to build relationships with commenting and playing and showing them and modeling and all of those things. Um, that comes before, well, what do I do now? He didn't answer. Well, why'd you ask him the question at all? You know? So um, I, I do like showing parents, caregivers, staff, the importance of that. I think one of the things that um, we get a lot of questions about is the parent training piece. And it's not how, how to do parent training or what to train on. I think that we have a lot of that information, but a lot of the challenge people have is having parents buy in to the importance of the parent training piece. How do you get parents to want to be trained or want to understand their, their role in this? Or, you know, how, how do you, like, how do you get that buy-in from parents? Okay. So there's a two part answer to that. Part one is we talk in language they understand. We use examples, uh, metaphors to their real life so that they can see that what we're saying actually makes sense and has a reason to work. Um, if I'm trying to teach a parent to, um, to not reinforce a specific behavior at a specific time, I relate that to something in their life where, okay, now you're at work and your boss is telling you, he wants you to do this much more, uh, work for the same amount of pay. How are you going to react to that? And then once they understand the concept, whatever that concept might be, then I apply it back to the child and say, okay, so now that's what we're doing to him. We're asking him in this situation to do this, this, and this, and how would you feel about that? And once they start to understand, not the principle itself, but the outcome or the 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 what happens because of that principle or the way that they're using it, um, you can get buy-in a lot quicker. Um, in most cases, you can start to get buy-in. So really learning how to uh, relate what you're doing and what you're saying to the family's home life is gonna make a big difference. Secondarily, there are some families that may not get it or may not want to get it, and they may not be the best families to work with when it comes to parent training. Uh, It's hard to say because you want to help every kid that comes to you, but uh, we need partners in that process. And sometimes the partners just aren't ready for what we're trying to do. So um, for the most part, the way to get buy-in is to really break things down and explain it um, in, in everyday basic language. Um, to really be able to clarify to them what works, why it works, how it's going to work, why they would want it, get them agreeing that, yeah, this is a pathway that makes sense, that'll get me to what I'm looking for. Um, and you can usually get buy-in with most most families that way. And if if you can't, then maybe it's not the right family for me to work with. Maybe this is a family that needs to go to a clinic where they're going to drop off their kid and they're going to do the best they can with their three, four hours a day of whatever they're doing. Um, but again, I talk to those families and say, you can get that, but what's happening the other 18 hours a day for that kid, uh, 18, I think I did my math wrong. Um, but what's happening the rest of the day, like who's teaching him then, and what is he learning that's going against what he's been learning in the clinic. So, um, for the most part, I've been pretty successful and I think that it's a skill in its own right. It's kind of its own little soft skill is getting people to understand and buy in, but, um, I think that's kind of one of the things that I've always been fairly good at, which is um, uh, which is why I teach it to other people. So hopefully, hopefully uh, people understand that just the basic concept is make it simple, make it make it understandable, make it relate to your own to their lives so that they can buy into it. So you've created the just seven steps. How are you sharing the information with the rest of the world? 
So I've got um, uh, what I'm trying to do now is 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 I've I've, I've gotten into the, you know thanks to Kara I've gotten into the whole social media thing. Uh, I have an Instagram. I have a, a Facebook page and a Facebook group. Um, and uh, what we're going to be doing is, and I've also started my own podcast and my own video blog. So I have a podcast that's available on all all platforms. Uh, it's called uh, Just Seven Steps. And so if you just put in just seven steps with the number seven, uh, you should be able to find my podcast anywhere it's at. Uh, the first four episodes are out now. We're releasing a new episode every week. I'm really excited about the topics we have coming up, the interviews I have. Uh, I have some really great interviews, one with Megan Miller. Uh, I have a, an interview I just finished with Steve Ward, uh, which we split into three parts because it was such a great conversation on motivation. Uh, I think the podcast is great for professionals and parents alike. Uh, and then I also created a video blog, which are shorter, kind of quick hit six to eight minute videos, uh, just talking about an individual topic of things that are coming up, things that people are searching for online. Uh, what do parents want to know? And I'm creating topics about that to kind of kind of get people's toes wet in this understanding that uh, working with your typical children who are giving you problems at home really would be benefited by understanding some of the basic principles and that it really is just seven steps that you need to understand to be able to start making that change to build both <clears throat> better cooperation with your kids but also to build a better relationship I love that. Well, congratulations. It sounds like you've been busy. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, we've been real busy, but uh, we're really just releasing and just launching it now. So I'd love to get some people out there checking it out and uh, um, commenting and and, and kind of helping us to, to get that information out to more people sharing it. So we'll see. Uh, but I've got great help. So I think it's going to go up. <laughs> Well, we'll definitely put on the show notes and we'll, we'll share with our audience. Um, most of our audience is, I would say like, you know, newly minted BCBAs or people who are just getting into the field, you know, or people have been in the field for quite a while. Um, we like to ask if there's like one thing that you would share with, uh, or one lesson that you think a BCBA needs to learn, whether it's one of your principles, um, or something else that you would, you know, pass on to the next generation of BCBAs. Um, I think, I think that if I was going to, if I was going to tell someone one thing and only one thing, it would be don't do anything unless you can make it fun. If you're trying to teach someone, anyone in your life, if you're trying to engage anyone in your life in anything, if you can't make it fun, you're going to lose them. They're not going to be interested in doing it. So it doesn't matter what the goal is. It doesn't matter if you're trying to teach them a body part or if you're trying to teach them shapes or colors. If you can't find a way to make it fun to them, you're going to lose them um, eventually at some point. So th there's really no reason to start with what do you want to teach? You always start with how can I be fun to this person? And within that fun, now where can I sneak my teaching into the fun that we're having? Because the child really has to, especially if you're with my children, the child really has to see you as um, someone they want to be with uh, for the long term if you're going to have any kind of effect on their life long term. So yeah, I think that's the most important thing. And step two to instructional control is all about how to do that. So yeah, Excellent. that's so important. I, I mean, both for our clients and I, I'm going to take that advice for my own kids because I think that applies to, like you said, any relationship that you have, you want people to want to be there. You want people to want to do things with you. And just because I can force my kids to do things doesn't mean that I should. Um, so I think that that's really important. Yeah, I, I, I have my two daughters. I have a 13 year old and a, I'm sorry, 14 and 12 now. They both just had birthdays, 14 and 12 year old. And so I'm getting into the teenage years and, you know, I'm going through all of that, that change in attitude and everything else. And uh, the things that I did my whole life, you know, I'm fun dad, right? But suddenly now I'm embarrassing dad. It's just what happens. And, uh, you know, you got to kind of lean into it and understand that that they're going through changes from toddler on up and you've got to kind of learn to roll with those punches okay. and, and learn how to, to stay fun uh, and understand there's going to be certain times where you can't be. And then sometimes you got to just give them some space. But uh, if you try to force your desires on your children, um, you may get what you need in the short term, but you damage the relationship and your ability to get things that are even more important down the road. So whether you're working with your own kids, whether you're working with uh, kids with disabilities, um, however, you're applying these principles in your life. Uh, step number two, uh, build better engagement and 75% fun 
never more than 25% expectation or work in a relationship is, is kind of your job. It's kind of your role. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank um, you so much, Robert. This was a really fascinating conversation. Um, and uh, I'm so hopefully our audience learned something about this and uh, definitely go check out just seven steps. And uh, I'm going to be downloading your podcast right now. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Just seven step podcast, uh, just seven steps blog on YouTube. And uh, the website itself is uh, just seven steps.com. <laughs>